folks, I've got such an awesome sponsor, you're not going to believe it. I am seriously excited that they decided to work with me. The Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. How cool is that? It's about their new exhibition, Highland Warriors, which of course are among the most iconic military figures in history whose reputation goes way beyond Scotland. And in this exhibition, they have over 200 artifacts, anything from broadswords to tartans, a lot of really impressive stuff. It shows the connections between the fierce medieval Gaelic warriors and the proud traditions of modern Canadian Highland regiments. You may have heard of a certain individual named John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill, aka Jack Churchill, aka Mad Jack, who went into World War II with a basket hilt broadsword, a longbow, and a bagpipe. He was with the Seaforth Highlanders and the Highland Light Infantry, among others, and he managed to capture over 40 Germans in a single raid. So that's an example of that Scottish stubbornness. I don't do Scottish accents very well. Anyway, so if you live in Ontario or can make it to Ottawa, I would highly recommend taking a trip to the Canadian War Museum and seeing that exhibition. I'll put information about it down below. You can check that out. And uh, now about something Less exciting, but hopefully entertaining, I'll tell you about the most disappointing weapons I've ever owned. I don't have any of them anymore, for obvious reasons, so I can't show them to you physically, but I can show you photos and video footage. And uh, not everything I've ever had or tried is going to be on this list. I'm limiting the list to 10, and it's going to be mainly about expectations. Uh, because some of the things that I've had over the years that were terrible, I didn't always have high expectations for. So this is going to be roughly in order of disappointedness, disappointment factor, whatever you want to call it. So the first one is the Austro-Hungarian Saber from Universal Swords. Now, this one I didn't have super high expectations for because I didn't really know what to expect. I haven't had any swords from that maker before or I think I might have had one before that. And so I was kind of like, yeah, looks nice. And I'm generally not very interested in military sabers between the 18th and 20th century. So there might be a bit of a bias there. But either way, it, it was not very good. The blade wasn't great. They make it with a dull edge because they're made in India. It's, it's because of local regulations. And the, the sharpening service was not good, so it did not perform very well. Uh, the, the grip was very uncomfortable because of these brass ornaments. I always hate when, when they put metal parts on the grip where it's just you, you keep rubbing on them and it's uh, handling and then overall fit and finish was kind of mediocre and it was I just wasn't very impressed. Uh, next up, the two-handed messer from... Nielo, Nielo, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, this I had reasonably high hopes for because it looked very good. It's one of the few two-handed messers on the market overall. There's very little really to be had. And uh, this is a straight one, which is also kind of rare. And this one also has a complex hilt that makes it almost like a Swiss Sabre. So a lot of interesting things about it. The overall design was very good. Now, I was really hoping for this to be good because a lot of people were asking me for, uh, you know, an alternative to the Albion Knecht, which is, of course, pretty expensive. And a lot of people like the Kriegsmesser or War Knife, but yeah, it was not great. The blade was kind of okay, didn't have the greatest geometry. Uh, the edge was bad, just really bad and it, it barely cut at all and the hilt loosened up and yeah i mean it, it wasn't a total disaster but for the price and for what i was hoping not good and next up i'm putting myself under scrutiny because this is something i designed myself the skull cleaver which um yeah, I was trying to design a knife slash hatchet hybrid that could be used as a survival tool that has you know, a number of different functions. I designed it so that you have the, the axe or hatchet part as a guard. If you hold it like a knife, then you could grab it by the unsharpened section of the blade to use it as a hand axe, a small hatchet, and a number of... of ideas and functions that I had in there and it just 
it didn't really turn out very well. <laughs> and it was rather disappointing overall. I had plans of maybe getting this into production because I was working together with a, a knife maker at the time. But, you know, I, I made two prototypes and I tested them out. And I was kind of like, you know, kind of nice as an experiment, but just it, I, I was trying too much there. Whenever you try to cram too many functions into one thing, you might end up with something that does everything a little bit, but rather poorly compared to the dedicated tools. So yeah, there you have it. And we've got number seven, which is the Feanor by Dark Sword. This is a quite a nice looking fantasy longsword. And I was hoping that this would be good because there aren't that many really functionally designed, properly made fantasy swords on the market. So I was hoping that this would perform very well, but mm, it, it didn't. The blade was overly flexible. It did have, a, again, a terrible edge, as you so often do. It started, the hilt started making weird clicking noises after a while, and it just... It just did not do well in the tests and it was just not worth the money, in my opinion. Number six is the Leif Eriksson sword from Windless Steelcrafts. Uh, I didn't even review this one. This was actually sent to me for review and I took it out of the box and was like, what? Really? And uh, I took a look at it and actually did a bit of research on it because I, I thought there's something off with the the shape of the guard. It does just doesn't look very much like usual Viking swords. As it turns out, it was designed after a find in Dibek, I think. And part of the scabbard actually kind of had rusted onto the guard. And at first the museum curators didn't realize that and, and put it together that way, as, as if that was the entire guard. But it was actually... Uh, scabbard fitting and you you would think well it's not that big of a deal right you just have a, a larger piece and it looks very pretty for sure but the problem is it just it messes with the balance and the entire thing overall just felt wrong it was way heavier than it should be even compared to some of the heavier viking swords that have been found and i said the balance in particular was just um it's kind of weird to have this case where you have too much mass in the hilt, so the balance is closer to the hilt than you expect, but it still feels clunky because of the overall weight. You know, it's, it's kind of weird. Normally when the balance is closer, it doesn't feel that heavy. Also, the stitching on the leather wrap on the grip just was too rough and did not feel good at all. So this was one of the very few cases, if not the only case, obviously disappointing to see that, that stubby little tang when it first broke. But uh, yeah, it's fixed now, but it was certainly high on the disappointment scale at the time. Number four, I decided to put the Naginata from Hanwei. Pole arms on the market are, are kind of rare-ish, and it's hard to find good ones, and I had very high hopes for it. And when I got it, already the Tsuba was loose, and the entire thing overall, you could feel the tang shifting inside off of the pole, and it was... It was kind of astonishing considering the, the price because it was six hundred dollars. Yeah, apparently it's still six hundred US dollars, uh, maybe a bit more or less depending on the individual store. But for that, it was kind of poorly shaped and just not very well put together. Maybe it was just that one. Although if I remember correctly, I read up on it and, and some other people also had concerns about it. I said, pole arms on the market are always a bit of a gamble. It's really not easy to find good ones. Number three on my list of most disappointing weapons might cause some rage and offense because there are a lot of fans. The Glock 35. Yeah, I know, right? So at the time that was back in Europe, where I had to be kind of strategic about my purchases. Uh, yes, you can legally own firearms in Europe. A lot of people are not aware of that, but it requires some paperwork. You have to get a license, and um, in some cases, you have to apply individually. It depends really on, on the country. In this case, there was like an upper limit of the maximum number of firearms that I could own, and, and only so many per different color, caliber, stuff like that. So I had narrowed it down to something chambered in 40 Smith & Wesson. And I, I can't even remember how many models I looked at, but there were ones that I would have much preferred, but 
in the end, I kind of narrowed it down to, you know what? I want the most reliable possible option. And everybody was ranting and raving about how super reliable and indestructible their Glock is and all of that and all the, the, the tests and all the videos you see, etc, etc. So I went with that. And then uh, first impression was, I don't know if my hands are that much different or whatever, but the grip, just terrible. I hated it. Uh, there, there's something about the angle and the shape of it that just didn't feel like it belongs in a human hand. Uh, obviously, a lot of people like how it, how it handles, but I could not stand it. That's obviously very subjective. What's not so subjective is all the failures to feed that I ran into. And uh, I, I went on this long quest to figure out what on earth is wrong with the damn thing. And it, it kept happening like every, I don't know, three or four out of ten, uh, depending on the day. Sometimes it was closer to four out of 20, but very regularly it would fail to feed the next round because it just kept nose diving into the feed ram. At first I tried a variety of different brands of ammunition and different shapes of bullets, etc. None of that helped. I let other people shoot it too to make sure that it's not just me. Uh, I actually made videos about it at the time uh, and, and people were, you know, guessing, oh, are you limp wristing it? But I, I don't think I was, and I, I said I let other people shoot it, and uh, they got the same thing, and it didn't really matter how you held it. And then I tried to replace the, the guide rod and recoil spring. I polished the feed ramp. Uh, I, I tried different magazines. So many things. Nothing ever fix the issue. So yeah, huge disappointment. And also the irony of it. I mean, I was going for the safe choice, supposedly. I wanted the, the reliable option that won't let me down. And, and yeah, that's that's what happened. I don't know if, if there's something specifically about the 35 or 40 Smith & Wesson in general, but the thing was uh, traumatizing. Okay, number two was a rapier and dagger that I got from Vladimir Cervenka. Uh, not directly, I bought it used, but I, I heard very positive things about Cervenka, and he's known, he has a very good reputation, uh, particularly also uh, Julian at Blunt Iron Burnaby has a side sword made by Cervenka. Uh, I, I might be mispronouncing it, by the way, and that one is excellent really damn good i had a chance to cut with it and it was very nice and then the rapier arrived and well the hilt was really nice the blade was unusable it was a noodle that's what i can't say i've never encountered a blade this crazy flexible uh, rapiers on the reproduction market often have that issue but this was just kind of absurd especially for a sword of this kind of value range. So that was, I mean, it was by far not the worst thing I've ever had. It was, you know, the rest of it, as I said, the hilt was great, uh, fit and finish were really good, and everything, you know, was, was overall really good, but the blade was just, and considering what I what I had spent to get it, uh, it was very, very disappointing. Um, so, on to number one, and I, I could have probably swapped the two. I could have changed the order anyway, as always the problem with these lists. What was called a Fox from Wolflund, and this was really more of a Romfaya. It was very disappointing because it was an extremely floppy blade. You know, the kind of thing where you, you wave it around, it just goes... It just goes Cthulhu on you. Not really too much else to say about it, other than it's not accurate for a falx either. I've shown much more accurate reproductions of falxes, falkis, falxy, falx type swords. Anyway, so yeah, there you have it. That's the list. Uh, hopefully I won't add too many over the years. I've generally been relatively good at avoiding the worst. Um, just, you know, doing your research beforehand before you buy something, see if there are reviews and um, all of that. So I haven't had too many terrible purchases considering how much stuff I've owned and bought and sold over the years. But anyway, um, hope this wasn't too rambly. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for watching, guys. Check out the links down below. 
and have a good one.